Hai, 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 hai. Tuk pamit. Coba. <laughs> hai, this is Clifford de la Cruz, and welcome to the subject, the contemporary world. Let's talk about the United Nations and Contemporary Global Governance. At the end of this lesson, you should be able to define global governance, identify roles and functions of the United Nations, and lastly, determine the challenges of global governance in the 21st century. Although many internationalists like Bentham and Kant imagine the possibility of a global government, nothing of the sort exists today. There is no one organization that various states are accountable to. No organization can militarily compel a state to obey predetermined global rules. There is some regularity in the general behavior of states. For example, they more or less follow global navigation routes and, more often than not, respect each other's territorial boundaries. When they don't, like Russia invaded Crimea in 2014, it becomes a cause for global concern and debate. The fact that states in an international order continue to adhere to certain global norms means that there is a semblance of world order despite the lack of single world government. Global governance refers to the various intersecting processes that create this order. There are many sources of global governance. States sign treaties and form organizations in the process legislating public international law, or these are the international rules that govern interactions between states as opposed to, say, private companies. International non-governmental organizations or the non-government organizations, though not having formal state power, can lobby individual states to behave in a certain way. For example, an international animal protection NGO can pressure governments to pass animal cruelty laws. Powerful transnational corporations can likewise have tremendous effects on global labor laws, environmental legislation, trade policy, and so on. Even ideas such as the need for global democracy or the clamor for good governance can influence the ways international actors behave. Let's talk about the most prominent international organization of today, the United Nations. The main headquarters of the United Nations is in New York. After the collapse of the League of Nations at the end of World War II, countries that worried about another global war began to push for the formation of a more lasting international league. The result was the creation of the UN. Although the organization is far from perfect, it should be emphasized it has so far achieved its primary goal of averting another global war. For this reason alone, the United Nations should be considered a success. The United Nations is divided into five organs. The General Assembly or the GA is UN's main deliberative policy-making and representative organ. According to the UN Charter, decisions on important questions such as those on peace and security, admission of new members, and budgetary matters require a two-thirds majority of the General Assembly. Decisions on other questions are done by simple majority. Annually, the General Assembly elects a GA president to serve a one-year term of office. All member states currently at 193 have seats in the General Assembly. The Philippines played a prominent role in the GA's early years when Filipino diplomat Carlos P. Romulo was elected GA president from 1949 to 1950. Here we can see that the Chinese President Xi Jinping addresses the United Nations General Assembly. Although the GA is the most representative organization in the UN, many commentators consider the Security Council or SC to be the most powerful. According to the UN, this body consists of 15 member states. The GA elects 10 of these 15 to a 2-year terms. The other 5, sometimes referred to as the Permanent 5 or the P5, are China, France, Russia, United Kingdom, and the United States. These states have been permanent members since the founding of the United Nations and cannot be replaced through election. The SC takes the lead in determining the existence of a threat to the peace or an act of aggression. It calls upon the parties to a dispute to settle the act by peaceful means and recommends methods of adjustment or terms of settlement. In some cases, it can resort to imposing sanctions or even authorizing the use of force to maintain or restore international peace and security. Because of these powers, states that seek to intervene militarily in another state need to obtain the approval of the SC. With the SC's approval, a military intervention may be deemed legal. This is an immense power. 
Much attention has been placed on the SCP-5 due to their permanent seats and because each country holds veto power over the Council's decisions. And here's the catch. It only takes one veto vote from a P-5 member to stop an SC action dead in its tracks. In this sense, the SC is heir to the tradition of great power diplomacy that began with the Metternich or the Concert of Europe system. It is especially telling that the P-5 consists of the major allied powers that won World War II. The third UN organ is the Economic and Social Council or the ECOSOC, which is the principal body for coordination, policy review, policy dialogue, and recommendations on social and environmental issues, as well as the implementation of internationally agreed development goals. It has 54 members elected for a three-year terms. Currently, it is the UN's central platform for discussions on sustainable development. The fourth is the International Court of Justice or the ICJ whose task is to settle in accordance with international law legal disputes submitted to it by states and to give advisory opinions referred to it by authorized United Nations organs and specialized agencies. The major cases of the court consist of disputes between states that voluntarily submit themselves to the court for arbitration. The court, as such, can try individuals, like international criminal cases are heard by the International Criminal Court, which is independent of the UN, and its decisions are only binding when states have explicitly agreed to place themselves before the court's authority. The SC may enforce the rulings of the ICJ, but this remains subject to the P5's veto power. Did you know that Filipinas played a significant role in creation of human rights arbitration rules in the United Nations? In the late 1960s, the diplomat Salvador P. Lopez was chairman of the United Nations Commissions on Human Rights. Lopez and other Filipinos helped design the system whereby any citizen of any state may petition the UN to look into human rights violation in a country. That system exists until today. Human rights, therefore, are not foreign impositions. They are part of our national heritage. And lastly, the Secretariat consists of the Secretary General and tens of thousands of international UN staff members who carry out the day-to-day -day work of the UN as mandated by the General Assembly and organization's other principal organs. It is the bureaucracy of the United Nations serving as a kind of international civil service. Members of the Secretariat serve in their capacity as UN employees and not as a state representatives. We've made mention before that this organization, the United Nations, is far from perfect. I think it is important to understand as well the challenges of the United Nations. Given the scope of the United Nations activities, it naturally faces numerous challenges. Chief among these are the limits placed upon its various organs and programs by the need to respect state sovereignty. The UN is not a world government, and it functions primarily because of voluntary cooperation from states. If states refuse to cooperate, the influence of the United Nations can be severely circumscribed. For example, the UN Council on Human Rights can send special rapporteurs to countries where alleged human rights violations are occurring. If a country does not invite the rapporteur or places conditions on his or her activities, however, this information gathering mechanism usually fails to achieve its goals. Perhaps the biggest challenge of the United Nations is related to issues of security. The United Security Council is tasked with authorizing international acts of military intervention. Because of the P5's veto power, it is tough for the Council to release a formal resolution, much more implement it. This became an issue, for example, in the late 1990s when the United States sought to intervene in the Kosovo War. Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic was committing acts of ethnic cleansing against ethnic Muslim Albanians in the province of Kosovo. Hundreds and thousands of Albanians were victims of massacres, mass deportations, and internal displacement. Amid this systematic terror, members of the North Atlantic Organization or NATO, led by the United States, sought SC authorization to intervene in the Kosovo War on humanitarian grounds. China and Russia, however, threatened to veto any action, rendering the UN incapable of addressing the crisis. In response, NATO decided to intervene on its own. Though the NATO intervention was largely a success, it nevertheless left the UN ineffectual. Today, a similar dynamic is evident in Syria, which is undergoing a civil war. Russia has threatened to veto any SC resolution against Syria. Therefore, the United Nations has done very little to stop state-sanctioned violence against opponents of the government. 
Since Syrian President Bashar al-Assad is an ally of Russian dictator Vladimir Putin, the latter has shied away from any policy that could weaken the legitimacy of the former. As a result, the UN is again ineffectual amid a conflict that has led to over 220,000 people dead and 11 million displaced. Despite these problems, it remains important for the SC to place a high bar on military intervention. The UN Security Council has been wrong on issues of intervention, but it has also made right decisions. When the United States sought to invade Iraq in 2001, it claimed that Iraq's Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction or the WMD that threatened the world. However, UN members Russia, China, and France were unconvinced and vetoed the UN resolution for intervention, forcing the United States to lead a small coalition of the willing with its allies. It has since been discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction and the invasion of Iraq has caused problems for the country and the region that lasts until today. In conclusion, global governance is such a complex issue that one can actually teach an entire course itself. This lesson focuses on the United Nations in particular. The UN is the closest to the world government. What is important to remember is that international organizations like UN are always in a precarious position. On the one hand, they are groups of sovereign states. On the other, they are organizations with their own rationalities and agendas. It is this tension that will continue to inform the evolution of these organizations. Note that there are many institutions, groups, and ideas that hold international and global politics together. In your own time, you might want to explore these topics on your own.